Okay, so um, this is uh, this page is for computational statistics AMT 3772.0 course. So basically, uh, this is a two credit course, and I uploaded the course outline. Um, so here it is. Um, for this course, there's a couple of prerequisites. So you have to know mathematical statistics first and the second courses, uh, because we are going to make use of them uh, within this course. And uh, you can read through this. I'll just explain the uh, schedule of this. So uh, basically, we are discussing R as a language. It's a statistical programming language that we use. Um, are you all familiar with programming languages before? Even as light as knowledge is fine, C, C, C sharp, Java, any, any programming language before? Uh, Y'all can unmute and talk. Ma'am, there are two students uh, who are from the management science. They haven't done okay. any CS stuff. And okay. Both of us have done CS in the first and second year. Computer science, okay. No, even though it's not, uh, okay, computer science is not mandatory for everyone, but even though uh, there were management students, uh, have they done any C language for mathematics in the first year? No, madam. No, no, right. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I just wanted to get some idea whether you all know this programming stuff. Uh, otherwise, I have to teach it from scratch. Uh, but the target here is uh, not basically teaching you R. Yes, I'm teaching you R, uh, but that is not the target. You're going to apply um, uh, programming skills uh, to whatever the things that you learn within these two courses, because this is not R as a programming language. This is basically computational statistics. So we have to focus on statistical concepts here. Uh, so in these courses, if you can remember, we did everything manually, right? Hypothesis testing, calculating probabilities, generating distributional data, things like that. But uh, by knowing a software, statistical software like this, you would be able to computerize everything, almost everything, and make your life easy. So that is basically the idea behind this course. Uh, so today we are going to... Uh, uh, I'm going to introduce you to this new language, R. Uh, and this is a high level language. Uh, so uh, it's not like C or C++. They are very low level languages. It's really hard um, uh, you know, to program by using low level languages. It's not that user friendly. It is user friendly, but not very user friendly like high level languages. And uh, you're going to learn how to generate uh, a couple of types of data. And then you're uh, going to do some preliminary analysis using uh, some data sets uh, by using R. Uh, preliminary analysis includes uh, getting descriptive statistics, generating graphs, tables, what you all usually do in a statistical analysis. And then you're going to learn control, control structures when programming, this is mandatory to know uh, if an else statement. If this happens, what is the condition? If the, else, this is what you're going to do. So things like that and some logical operators. So that is all R uh, and some loops. When you, are, when you have to do the same thing repeatedly uh, and if you're using a software, there's no point writing the entire thing. You can just identify some pattern and put it in a loop and generate things. So you're going to learn that as well. So under the third chapter, we are doing further data analysis using packages. Uh, it's, uh, it's just like libraries. Computer science students know this. Um, so we are uh, usually using the basic package. We call it the base package. Uh, but when time goes on, you can import, you can install other packages and make use of them to make your life easy. That's what. So uh, then you have to construct and compare the hypothesis testing using simulation analysis, parametric, non-parametric tests. Uh, Mid-semester, I am not really sure about this. I uh, thought of going with assignments because 
if I give you just a single mid semester and if you couldn't score, then it's going to be a problem for your final grade. Um, so if you if we do continuous assignments, uh, then you can really score. What I want you to is score more as uh, as more as possible, right? So I might not give the mid semester, even though I give a mid semester. Uh, I will uh, give you some assignments as well so that you can score a lot. Uh, today also I'm going to give you an assignment after this. You'll be thankful uh, to give, for me to giving such a, a easy assignment for you, uh, right? So it's not going to be a hard one. Usually um, in lectures, they give assignments in third or fourth week, but you know, when every lecturer is going to give you uh, assignments in third or fourth week, you, you are going to pack up. Right, so that's why I decided to give it in an off peak uh, week so that you can slowly attempt it. And usually in my ass assignments, I uh, give you 20 to 30 days to complete the assignments, although it's a small one. So you can leisurely take your time and finish it off. So that is done by my side. So not to worry. Uh, non parametric test, yes, we told that, and data modeling. Uh, I think in this semester you have regression analysis, so you'll learn what data modeling is there uh, and empirical distributions, data driven distributions. And finally, we are going to program uh, some functions uh, using R because so far up to this point, we are using, making use of the inbuilt function of functions of R. And in this chapter, we are going to learn uh, to May create functions of ourselves, right? So it is uh, subjective to whoever the programmer it is. So we are going to discuss that as well. Um, okay, these are the references. You just don't have to stick to these. This is a programming language. You can simply Google out anything. Uh, and in the final exam, although it is physical or it's conducted online, this is going to be an open book exam uh, because I. I cannot expect you to study the syntaxes. You, it's an advantage to know the basic syntaxes. When you keep on practicing, you will get it. Uh, but I cannot expect you to study everything by heart, everything that is not the way of learning a programming language. So this is open book, although it is physical or online. Any questions regarding the outline? Is everything clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. So let's start off uh, installing R. So basically, um, no, before that, um, here under lecture one, I have put up a video uh, on installing R and R Studio. I'll tell you the difference. Installing R and R Studio for Windows 10. So this is just a general video I just took from YouTube. Uh, there's millions of videos. If you find it difficult uh, installing this, you can simply do a Google search and find it out. I'm going to teach you how to do it, but in my computer, I have already installed uh, RNR Studio because I have worked with these softwares, so I can't be installing it again. Uh, so I'll show you the pathway of uh, finding this. Um, so these are the steps. Um, you have to first so in installation. What okay. So installation goes in these steps. First, you have to install R. Then you have to install R Studio. Both, you can uh, get this done by CRAN. So there are so many versions. For Windows, there's uh, one platform. For Mac OS, if you have an Apple computer, there's another. Same way, you have to install, same command, same conditions, uh, but the versions are slightly different. So all could be found under uh, this page, you have to go to this website 
and install R first because this is the platform to run all the codes. This is the most basic um, software package that we have. R Studio is a way modified than this. Uh, so I'll show you both the interfaces. This you just have to write a script file and that's it. You have to run then and there. In R Studio, um, there's a couple of advantages. When you are typing a word, you are getting suggestions. So mm -hmm. something like that. It's sort of an editor, a good editor, uh, very user friendly to use R Studio. So we are not using R, we are using R Studio, but we have to have R installed to our computer in order to run, in order to work with R Studio. So only we cannot work with this. That's why we are installing both. Um, right, you can take screenshots at any time. Uh, anyway, I'm going to post this recording after this lecture. So absentees can go through, um, even you all can go through. Um, okay, so let me share my screen back. Again, if you have questions, please interrupt and ask me, otherwise I would be keep on keeping on uh, talking. So um, just interrupt and ask questions. Okay, so I'll show you how to um, install R. So you can simply type R trend. Just go with the first option that you are getting. You are getting the most recent version of it. Here, see, this is download R for Windows. If you have a Mac, if you have a Linux, I, I know you should be using Windows, if you are using Mac or Linux, um, you have to specify your OS and then download. So this is the basic way of installing R. You just have to click on this. Okay, this is R, this is the version for Windows and 32-bit or 64-bit. These are the computer specifications. So you can simply click on this and the file would be downloaded. And just like, um, you, are, uh, you have to follow the same method when you're usually installing a software, right? You have to extract the file, click on next, 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 accept, and then finish, something like that. So I'm not going to download it because it is already, down, already downloaded to my computer. You just have to click on this, go to your downloads or the place where this file is downloaded, and you will understand what to do next. If not, you can watch this video. Everything is explained there. They are downloading the file and they are installing it to the computer. Okay. And that is how you install R. R looks like this. Um, so R look like, looks like this. It's not that nice uh, like R Studio. You have to type things here. So just don't worry about the syntax. I'll teach you what these are. If I print X, you are getting, this is a vector basically. If I print X, you are getting this. Let's say T is equal to six. You can use either this sign or this sign to assign something. Usually in R, we are going with this, doesn't matter. You can even say uh, same meaning. Okay. So this is R. We are not using this. This is not that friendly. Um, so I'm closing this without saving. And you have to install that first. Then what you should do is So this is my OS, Windows 10, so I'm doing this. So you can simply click on this or you can just check out the specifications. Um, you have to click here because our Studio desktop, that is the version that we are using. Uh, no need of going to the server because we are not online handling files online. These are paid versions. R is a freely available software, so you can simply download this. This is more than enough for our course. And even further, this is more than enough. Um, yeah, so you can simply download it here, R Studio Desktop, from this website. 
he see, see here also they are giving you the steps of doing it first you have to install r then download r studio desktop and you have to install the same thing similarly like how you installed r that is what you have to do um so even you can download it from here this is for windows 10 see here this is for mac os if you are using a mac you can install this ubuntu this fedora this likewise uh, you have so many versions here so depending on your personal computer you have to uh, go with it basically this is for windows that is how we search for okay is there any questions in this regard you can find all these in this uh, link but i told you everything i didn't show you how to install it to your computer but i showed you where to download and uh, i just told you how to install any questions Are there any questions? No, madam. Okay, if you have any, please ask. Um, cool. So you don't have to install it now. Uh, you can simply uh, watch the recording or either uh, you can, uh, okay, you can simply either watch the recording or you can uh, just go to that YouTube video. You don't have to stick to that video only. You can search and see anything. Mm, and slowly, leisurely do the thing. So today, um, let's start off with some uh, introduction to our studio. So let me. So this is the icon of our studio. You just have to double click on it. When it, once you install, everything will be there. Um, okay, so you have to first see uh, the panels. So in R, we had only this part. We can move. In R, when we opened R, we had this thing. This is what we had in R. Okay, but here you will see several other panes or panels. Okay, this is called um the script file so this is basically an r script file okay this is the console by name it is given this is the console console is the place where these codes are compiled i'll tell you what to do with this this is the environment so make sure you have it uh as the global environment you can separately save this using this icon um when we create some variable that goes to the environment and that is going to be saved there. Okay. And this is where you see your files, your plots, when you uh, prepare graphs and all that, it's coming under these plots pane. And packages, I'll come to this in upcoming lectures and if you want to find out something regarding some inbuilt function in R that appears in this help section, you can simply type it here or there's a command. I'll let you know. Viva is for um, graphs uh, using um, pre prepared by using uh, Plotly. So that is another um, package that we use to uh, generate some advanced graphs, some moving GIF type graphs, uh, 3D graphs, and all that. Uh, so, we are not going that far within this course. We are simply using this panel. Um, okay. So, this is just to show you how this interface looks like. So usually um commands in R, when I say in R, uh, don't worry, is this R or R studio? R studio is just a platform that you use to compile 
R is the language. Okay, R is the language. Just like C, just like C++, R is the language. So we are going to make use of this language um, to do computational statistics. Okay, commands in R are called functions. These are the technical terms that you have to learn. So there are two types of functions. One is called inbuilt functions. What are inbuilt functions? The functions that are inbuilt, embedded by themselves, right? For example, mean of x. So this is an inbuilt function. Mean something. You have to give you have to pass some argument here, a vector or an array here to get the average, simple average. So mean, this is a function. Okay, so I'll show you that. Um, so let's assume we have uh, x, just don't worry about these. And this is our x. So mean, if we want to compute the mean of 1, 2, and 3, we just have to give this inbuilt function and press enter. So 2 is the mean of these three values. So this is an inbuilt function because we didn't define this function. We didn't create our own function to compute the mean summation x i over n. We didn't give that. So it is there in our base package. Base package is already installed when we are initially installing R and R Studio. Base package is the base is the most basic package. There are some advanced inbuilt functions that we have to extract from other packages, you have to install a particular package, call the library, and then run the command. All those are inbuilt functions. The second type is user-defined functions. User-defined functions. This is what we are going to learn in our fourth chapter or the last chapter, functions. We are defining our own functions. So um, I'll simply show you a way of doing that. Um, so don't worry about what I'm writing because we are going to learn this. This is just an outline. So you don't have to write these things. Okay, just look at the board and just listen to the story. Okay, so this is my function name. Okay. You don't have to write this. I'm teaching this to you in the fourth chapter. I'm just showing you. Function. Um, I can't do that here. I think so what I'm doing here, okay? Um, right.
I think I did it right. Let's see. Yeah. So what I did was I defined a function to compute the mean. I didn't use this user defined function mean x. So x is there, x is a vector of values, a sequence of values. X is one, two, three. This is sort of our data set. Okay. X, is, X can take these values. This is our variable. Okay. I want to find the mean of these. So as I knew, R had uh, an inbuilt function to compute the mean of X, mean of some, some uh, vector. I used it and I got the value. If I didn't know that our base package has this, there's no other option. I have to write my own function. I have to. So some of something is also uh, a function just like the mean. Okay. Even for this, we can write a separate um, function. Okay. I just use that inbuilt function here. I'm going to take sum of one, two, three, one plus two plus three. That is by this one, divide it by the length of the vector. I'm going to pass something here and divide it by the length of this. Mean length of this is what? The size of this one, two, three. You have three elements here. So we take the summation divided by three and you are going to print whatever the value you got here. So that is basically the function. I'm going to teach this to you, okay? I don't want to teach you how to write a function to find the mean of a variable. I'm not teaching you this here. I'm just showing you this is a user-defined function because I, the user, myself, defined this function for me. And I, and I wanted to pass some um, vector here and I found the same answer. I got the same answer. Okay, so that is what I did. So this type of things are called user-defined functions because I defined it myself. This is my own creation. Okay, uh, I, I know CS people can understand this. Uh, others, can they? Not uh, the creation of this function. I'm just asking you whether you understood the difference between in inbuilt function and user-defined functions. Did you? You don't have to write this. Any questions? Any questions? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, you are Okay. Functions that the user defines. Thank you for that, Tommy. Um, so, there's another um, couple of terms that we have to know. One is data objects. It's another name given for variables, just like X that we constructed, okay? Uh, for example, height is a variable, weight is a variable, something like that, but just a variable, okay? So functions are, um yeah something like this some something uh which is created to do some uh, do some task using variables okay if you are interested to compute uh the body mass index that is bmi what is the formula if you know that is weight in kilograms assume that this is in kilograms and this is in uh, meters weight divided by square of height So this is a function. What is the task here? You are going to find the BMI by using the variables. So even in that function, which I wrote to compute the mean, what we did was we took the summation of the particular variable that we had and divided by the size of this, the length of this. And we got two. So same thing, right? 
So this is the functionality here. Uh, okay. So all these collectively, all these are called the R environment. Okay. That is what you can see in this section. See values, variables or the objects. It's coming here. Under functions, see I have created some function that is mentioned here. So this is what you call the environment. Here you can find the history. History uh, has everything that I did. So these are, this is my previous work. This is my own personal previous work that I did using R. Everything is there in history, right? You can save the history separately, environment separately. I teach you how to save R as well. Uh, okay, you don't have to worry about this. So now I think uh, without teaching, you should have gotten what I did here. So if we have a script, this is called the R script file. If we have the script, you can simply change things, right? Assume uh, you're not computing average here. Assume that you want to take the multiplication of this. Doesn't matter, right? It's a function. It's not the average, it's something else, okay? So you can simply change it. You can simply make changes. So this is the advantage of R Studio, right? Now this is, see, the value is changed. You took the summation one plus two plus three multiplied by three. So this is what you're getting. You can simply make changes if you use an R script rather than the R console because you can't delete and see, you can't delete. If I press delete button, not, it just jumps here. So this is done. Gone is gone in the console, right? But you can make any change if you write your code in a script like this. You can make any change and you can uh, save it for your future use. That is why we encourage you to use a script because you can see what you have done. Otherwise, when you type something here and press enter, this is going to compile the answer for you. So we are not always getting line by line compilations. So it's always uh, good to use the R script. What you have to do is you write whatever the things you need to uh, compute here, right? You can either keep your cursor here and press run. When you put run, this entire curly uh, thing between these curly bracket gets compiled. Okay. So if I want to run only this line, you can keep the cursor here and press this run button and see it's there. I'll just clear this up. Can you see this brush mark? When I click on that, the console is cleared, but the environment is there. If you want to clear the environment, you have to click here. Then you have to run everything from the beginning. Let's clear this up. Yes. And if you run this, you'll be getting an error. Why? Because they don't know what X is. They don't know what this average is because we didn't compile this. We cleared the environment. We cleared whatever the things in the environment. They don't know. You have to run it once again. Okay. So there's a shortcut, uh, keyboard shortcut for this. You can highlight whatever the lines that you want to run at once and press control enter or you can simply highlight whatever the things that you want to run and press run even if you take the cursor here can you see ctrl plus enter the keyboard command is there okay so everything is there that is why i said r using r studio is 
very interesting and very easy rather than using R. In R, we have only this part. You have to do everything there. It's very hard. R studio, you can do anything. So get used to this. See, we compiled this part. This function came here under functions. Now, if we run this line, okay, still we should not be getting any output. Why? Object X is not found because we cleared the environment. So in that case, we have to view. There are several ways of giving this. I'll teach you that. Now we gave values one, two, three for X. And if I keep my cursor here, press control enter, that particular line would run. See, six. I did a mistake. It's not one to two, it's one to three. Previous example. Okay. Right? Now here I'm giving two times x. That is, this is one, two, three, you know, two times x will give you two, four, six. So if I run this line, I'm getting that answer. Now they know what x is. Right? So that is the consequence of cleaning out this environment. If we clean this off, you have to run the same thing once again. If not, you just can compile from there itself. Okay. Um, so that is that. Uh, just to get you some idea. So, yeah, I told you collectively environment means collection of these two functions and variables. Okay. Objects and their attributes, okay. So before doing anything, I'll teach you how to save this. There's a couple of methods, right? You can simply save this panel by panel. All that you have to say is this, uh, save is this one and this one. So this is the R script file. This is the environment. If you want to save the environment, you can simply click on this. And you have to browse through and give a location. So if I save it in the desktop, As I, I give a name as test so that environment is saved. If I want to save this, so this is untitled, right? If we open up a script that is untitled, so you can simply click on this. You can tick this one, source on save, because when you uh, write things, when you change things, that gets saved. So, you can simply click on this to save the script file. I'll give the same name because the file type is different uh, in the same place that also got saved. Even you can run these lines. She's also is saved like this. Save dot image. Okay. So let's minimize and see. This is there. Uh, give it as Art Studio. Okay. Do you want to load? Uh, yes. Okay, I have to close this. Right. So this is the .r file. This is our R script file. You can simply open up this. So environment is empty in this case. See, our, in our script file, in, in the environment file, you can uh, simply find everything here. So, yeah. Yeah. 
you can simply go to file save so as i saved this before it's not getting saved i'll just untick this file i'll go to save as if i want to save it once again save as so test two i'll save the same file same content but in a different name just to show you the difference okay if that is the case you are again going to save the same thing the entire thing at once mm -hmm. there is it when you close it this is there did i save it in the desktop file save as This computer is, uh, I, I don't know, running out of something. Um, it's getting saved as something else. I just tick that always save as an RStudio file. So initially when you do things, uh, that will happen. So test2.r, see untitled file has, has become test2.r. This is a script file. The extension is dot capital R, okay? If we open this one, Test two, yeah, that is test this one. Yeah, that is uh, because I just uh, over overwrote in it. Okay, same thing. Um, this one here, test dot r. This was what I was going to show you. Same file, test2.r, test.r. This we used uh, the command in here, the save command in here. This we used file save as command and we browsed through where the, and gave the location where we want to save it. Okay, so that is how you save a file. Uh, yes. If you want to get a new R script, you simply have to click here. Can you see this plus sign? You can simply click there and click on R script. There are different types of files. C++ even could be compiled here by using this editor, right? SQL, R Markdown, Shiny, everything is there. So you just simply go to this R script and you're getting a new one. You can just click and drag and place the files wherever you want, doesn't matter. You can click on the tab and activate the file that you want. If you want this one, you can. You have to click on this. If you want this one, you have to click on that, okay? And if you want to click, if you want to start a new, new R script in within this project, you are going to click on that. So it's a good practice to always save and start. Otherwise, if there's a power interruption or any technical issue, your script will be gone and it might not be able to recover as you think, as easy as you think. So it's always advised whenever you open up a new project to save the script file or you can start saving the entire project. Okay, I'll teach you that as well. So let me close this for the moment and delete everything here. Okay, now I'm going to open up a new project. So we can simply close this. So it says this file is deleted or moved. Do you want to close this file now? Yes. Okay, so this is, uh, you can simply clean this environment as well. So this is a very new, fresh uh, thing that you are getting when you open RStudio. 
right? Initially, when you installed R Studio, this is the first uh, glance that we will see. So you can open up a new directory, directory and put everything there. You go to File, New Project. Okay, saving the script is different, saving the environment is different, saving the entire project is different. So when you save the entire project, every file is there within a folder. I'll show you that. Mm. Okay, so I'll do some, I'll write something here. Both are same. Okay. And I'm going to say this file. Uh, new directory. Or you can go with the existing directory. If you want to have this thing there, if you want, so this is an old file. I had some commands here, right? If I want to disregard this, and if I want to go with a new file, new project, I want to forget everything in the past. I want something very new. I have to go to, I'll show you once again, file, new project. That is the command. Hmm. Okay. Go to new directory. Here, give new project. And you have to give a directory name. Let's say one. And you have to browse and specify a location. Why always go into these documents? Because in my computer, our software is installed within documents. That is why it's going for its original destination. But I don't want to have it there. I can't navigate through everything every time. What I want is to have it saved in my desktop or maybe any other folder, doesn't matter, wherever I want to. So for the moment, I'll choose desktop, okay? And uh, yeah, so desktop, I have to create a new folder here. So I right click, go to new, create a folder. I just give that a name and I have to select that folder. In that folder, I can open it up. Okay. You can either open it in a new session or an existing session. That's fine. Then you have to click on create project. When you click on that, so I didn't take that open it on a new session. So I'm getting this is the only file that I have. So this is to uh, regularize this. When you click on this, it goes down. And see, this is a very fresh project. And the project name is 1-R Studio. OK, so within that, you can save the script file. You can save the environment, whatever it is. So basically, it's a good practice to start saving the script file. So you click on this. I'll give the same name to the script file. The extension is .r as it is the R script file. The destination is correct. Within desktop, within R files, within one, I have this same. So if I close this, this is the folder that I created to have all my R files in. So there I have my first project. This is the project file. Within that, I have everything, the history, the script file, and this is the project. When you click on this, you open the entire project. Okay. When you open this, you are opening the script file. This is you have all these, but you are opening the script file. So that is how you save a file um, in R. So let's say we want to save another file. We'll see how we are going to do that. File. I want to have a new project. Let's say new directory, new project. 
let's name it as two. And uh, this pathway is correct, uses this one desktop within our files. I can browse and even change if I want. So the destination is there, create project. Okay. When I close that within this file, see, I have two folders. One is for the first project. The other one is for the second project. Here, I didn't save the script file separately so that I don't have the script. If I save the script file as well, I have to open this project. If I want to save the script file separately, because say that you are emailing your R script to someone else, then you have to have a separate script file, right? So in that case, you have to save the script as well. Okay, so in this case, you either by pressing Control S or either by clicking on this, the destination is correct. You are giving the name and save. When you go there, you can see the script file as well. This is the project file with environment and everything. This is the script file. So if you want to email your working, if you want to upload your working to somewhere, it's enough uploading only the script file. It depends on uh, how you are expected to do, right? Anybody can run the script file in their R studio. So that is all about saving a file. Mm. Okay. Right, now we can start off with today's lesson. Let me delete this and embody. Okay, I'm going to clean everything just to start a fresh session. So. When you go to our studio, oh, it's still there. Okay. When you open up our studio, you're getting a blank thing like this. Okay, so the console is blank, the script is blank, it is not saved, untitled, uh, the environment is empty, everything is empty. Okay, this is a fresh file that you are going to work with. So first of all, I'm going to save, save my script file only because I'm not interested in saving the project file. So I just click on save. I'll name it as lecture one in my desktop. Save, okay. You can do anything for these pains. So, I'll teach you how to write a comment. Now you are going to learn the syntax in R. Now you learned all of the environment and how to handle it, how to save objects, functions, and all that. Now we are going to learn a couple of syntaxes, uh, how to give out commands. Okay, saving is done. First of all, you'll learn how to write a comment. Comments are used um, to specify which task that you did, right? Uh, because when it comes to a company, somebody uh, might program something and just, uh, let's say, kicked off, and the new person comes there and start from the um, place where the previous person stopped. He should be able to know what this person had done. By reading a code, it's very rigorous to get things out. So it is a good practice when you are writing codes, when you are defining variables, when you are doing something, it's a good practice to put a comment. And that comment is not being compiled. You can write anything in a comment which is not affecting the compilation. So how do you write a comment in R? You put a hash. You can simply say, it's a comment. 
Okay. So time to time, it's a good practice to save if you are not using a charged laptop or even you, when if you're using a laptop, there could be crashes. So uh, it's a very good practice to save it uh, a minute by minute if you can in every minute. So it's just a matter of pressing control S or you can simply click on this. Okay. So if you want to have another comment, these are just comments. You can simply press this. It is saved. Okay. And if you want to comment multiple lines, okay. So say this is line one. you have multiple lines, uh, let's say you have hundreds of lines, you can't be putting these hashtags all the time, right? It's, you know, it's annoying to do that. So what you should do is you can simply highlight this. You can write these commands, right? Simply highlight all the lines that you want to comment and press Control Shift C. I'll give that to you. Those are just shortcuts. My writing pad is somewhere else. Control, Shift, and C to comment multiple lines at once, use the keyboard command. I won't be asking these things to the paper. You don't have to study. I just uh, want to make things easier. That's why I told you this. Um, I'm not asking what is the command to comment multiple lines at once. I'm not asking things like that. I just told you. OK. Um, Right. So usually when I'm doing this, I would come in my name or like someone or maybe the name. Um, so I'm going to discuss how to construct vectors. That would be the comment. Vectors are uh, the usual things that you know vectors as vectors. It's a sequence of numbers, right? It is one dimensional, okay? You can give the variable name, let's say X, you can give any name and you have to click this, uh, type this in equal design and this hyphen, put a space. Spaces are not mandatory here, but it's, uh, very readable when you keep spaces where necessary. Okay, don't keep spaces between this. It's not going to work. You can either omit this space or keep this space, doesn't matter. To make it readable, I'm keeping spaces and writing this. Okay, so C is to give a sequence of comma separated data. C. Okay, and I'm within a bracket. So this is an advantage of our studio. When you type the first bracket with shift, it automatically gives you the other bracket. In R, this doesn't happen. You have to type each and every bracket. This is, so you're not going to lose brackets in this case if you properly do this, okay? C, and I'm going to give some data, okay? Assume I want to have uh, five, seven, negative eight, 9.3 okay and when i press control enter that thing compiles always saved when it is not saved this is appearing to be red and if it is saved it is black okay i can so this is a vector if I want to get extract the value, so this is just assignment of the values to x. Okay. If I want to print 
the values of x i just have to type x and run it see i'm getting it like this this is one dimensional you just have a row vector like this you are getting a row vector like this right and why are they giving this point something because i had a decimal value here that is why they are to be consistent they are giving 5.0 so 1.0 so we can't get we can get rid of that but not for the moment okay if we have if you don't have a decimal they should probably be giving this okay and remember now i changed this i changed this but if but i didn't compile this line okay what i compiled was this i'm still not getting the changed one why because i didn't compile the change if i make any change to something i have to compile that line as well now only i am getting the updated version so make sure you are compiling everything that we change uh there's another way of uh, making vector so let's say you want to have um all the numbers from 1 to 100 so you can't be typing you can't be doing like this right it's very rigorous you can't type all the numbers so in that case what you do is you use the colon one colon okay simply you have to give it like that so you are getting all the values from one to one If you want to assign some value to a variable, I think I did this before. Let's say t. The value of t is, uh, let's say eight. You just have to use this assignment mark. You print t. It will give you eight. Okay. And assume you want to add hundred uh, y and t. what is adding y and t let's see y plus t and when you run that to this entire vector from 1 to 100 they have added 8 so 1 plus 8 is 9 2 plus 8 is 10 3 plus 8 is 11 likewise 100 plus 8 is 108 so when you add a number to a vector each element of the vector gets increased by that number that is usual mathematics right so this is a vector addition if you want to multiply it um y times t you are getting this 1 times 8 is 8 2 times 8 is 16 3 times 8 is 24 likewise 100 times 8 is 800 you're getting that so you can do any mathematical operation in that way you call it a vectorized operation so here i would comment for the sake of identifying this vectorized operations even though you compile this nothing would happen they are not getting compiled to me these are not compiled just comments for identification purposes okay right if you want to pull out values let's say you want to pull out the third value of this vector 
you are simply going to call the vector x and put the square bracket. When you press one square bracket, the next closing bracket is appearing, automatically appearing in our studio. If you want to get the third element, extract the third element of this, what is it? Negative eight, right? You just have to type three to denote we want the third element out of this. And you are going to run that line. See, we are getting negative eight. Say you give an invalid argument like this, it is getting numeric zero. This is the output, we cannot help it because zeroth position is not there. It's not like array. People who have done CS, even I have done computer science, um, arrays are numbered indexed from zero, one, two, three, four. But in this, first element is indexed as one. Second element is indexed as two. So don't confuse, that is computer science, that is C, that is arrays, this is vectors, okay? This is the first element, second element, third element, likewise. Within brackets, what, what we are giving is the first element. Index of the first element is one, not zero. That is why when we give something like this, we are getting something unacceptable. It's not actually unacceptable, there's no so-called zero element. We are getting something like this. If we give something out of scope, what will happen? So this has, uh, okay, I want to show you something. I want to take the size of this vector. It's hard to count one, two, three, likewise, because you know at the first glance, you cannot count it like that. So you use the command length. When you type this, see, the, it suggests inbuilt functions. So this is also function, inbuilt function. And you are getting the helpers so here, length of x. Get or set the length of vectors, including list and factors. I'll teach you what of any R object. So you can simply press enter. This word would come with the bracket. L-E-N-G, you type and the suggestion comes out. You can simply press enter. So it's just a matter of typing within the brackets. Control enter will give you seven. Okay, the size of is this seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, we have seven numbers. Okay, assume we give, I want to extract the 10th position. This vector is of size seven. I'm asking them to give me out the 10th value, which is not existing. Let's see what they give. NA, not available. NA means not available. So I'll type here, which means not available. Right. Okay. Um, so that is what I wanted to discuss uh, on vectors. Now let's see how to construct matrices. All these are uh, objects. Uh, and remember one thing, R is case sensitive. That means uh, sensitive to capitalization. Okay, uh, you can't write capital L and the rest is simple length. No, that is not going to work. This is this function is built like this, so you have to give the name as it is. It is case sensitive. Case sensitive means it's sensitive for capitalization. Places where it requires capital letters, it should be given capital letters. Right now, let's see how to construct matrices. Any problems? In vectors, did you understand this? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you for confirming. Okay, matrices. So you know what matrices is? Um, just it's a sort of a vector, but vector is one dimensional. 
matrices are two dimension 2d we have row index and a column index so let's denote our matrix as uh, we'll give another letter which we didn't use w the command is matrix c in the base package that we have they're suggesting us the function it's just a matter of typing enter this is the order that we have to give data number of rows number of columns you want the matrix by row or by columns so these are the arguments so let's say simply we want to uh, have numbers from 1 to 20 in the matrix so what is the easiest way of giving 1 to 20 c 1 2 3 4 5 6 up to 20 no right the easiest way of giving 1 to 20 is 1 2 20 comma so this is the first argument that we gave in matrices hmm. before doing this i'll teach you how to use the help command because then I, then and there i can show you how to give these arguments okay so assume i want to construct a matrix uh, with values 1 to 20 uh, so there can be several methods of constructing a matrix it can be 1 by 20 matrix it can be 5 by 4 matrix we have 20 elements right it can be 10 by uh, 2 matrix we don't know right so we have to specify it. but assume that uh, i don't know uh, under which argument i should give the row name and the column name and i don't know how to give a command to write the matrix what you can do is you can search one thing you can go to google and search how to um, construct a matrix using r it will give you all the steps right without going for you google you can simply type a question mark here or you can do it here even either sides you can do type a question mark and write the function name sorry and see under the help tab here you are getting all the details about this function matrix matrix is the function here let's see what you're getting matrix this is the description creates a matrix from a given set of values so these are some other functions just leave it like that usage see this is the usage so what is the first argument that you have to give you have to give so this is the by default it has no arguments right so by default you have to enter your data set a vector of data as the first arguments which you want to have included that in the matrix in order it can be either row wise or column wise you can give that thing here so the first arguments argument is giving the data you can either type it like this or you can simply type it like this data equals this or you can give the first argument as this if you are not typing the argument name you have to go in this order you have to first give the data then you have to specify the number of rows then you have to specify the number of columns likewise if you are not writing this because r has to know okay these information are gotten in this order if if we are if we want to give uh the elements that should be included in the matrix at the end then we have to specify we have to tell r okay i'm giving the data only by the end of this line so you can put this thing here doesn't matter the thing is you have to say data equals your values okay so if you're not specifying something like this you have to go in order that's all what i have to say then n row means number of rows how do you know this data means data n row means number of rows. how do you know this see in r they are giving us okay these are the arguments data means what n row means what they are giving everything 
here. And sometimes they work out an example also. See, they have worked out an example. See, they have given the data first, number of rows, number of columns. By row, true means fill these elements row wise. If this is given as false, these elements are filled column wise. I'll show you that. Okay. So everything is given under description and under argument. So end row means the desired number of rows you have to incorporate in your matrix. And call means desired number of columns that you have to incorporate in the matrix. By row is a logical one. True, false one. Logical, true or false. If false, by default it is false, which means it's not filling these elements row wise. False means that by default, if we don't specify anything here, if we don't give an argument here, by itself it fills out 1 to 20 numbers column wise. Because this is the default argument that we give by default in here. If we want to have this row wise, we have to mention that by row is equals to four, uh, true. Okay, by row, yes, true. So everything is there. Dim names. It's an attribute to matrix, null or list of length two, giving the row and column names respectively. Dim names will give you the names of the rows and columns. An empty list is treated as null. Initially, if we don't give any row or column names, it is null. And list of length, uh, one as row names. Okay, so that is that. X is an R object. What is X? These matrix X. Okay. I'll teach you this. So here we are going to give our data. And I let's say I want to have uh, I want to have five rows. And I want to have four columns. I'm not specifying this. Even you can specify this or you just can leave it. You don't have to write all the arguments. This is man data set is mandatory. This is mandatory. I, either of these, let's see. Okay, so W is created. Now we are checking how it looks. See, I didn't give by row equals false or true or anything. So by default, it is filling the numbers column wise because this says by row is logical. If false, by default, the matrix is filled by columns. So this is column wise, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Likewise, column wise, it has filled. If I want this to appear row wise, I have to give the same thing. So I'll denote it as W1. I have to say by row equals true. You can either write capital T or you can write true. Okay. If you're writing true, you have to write it like this. Or you can simply put capital T and it's taking as true. When you compile, see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Likewise, you have gotten the elements, one to 20 elements row-wise. Okay. And uh, let's say we didn't give this argument. Still, this has to create a matrix because there are 20 elements. I say uh, number of rows should be five. So if we have 20 elements in total, if the number of rows are five, of course, definitely number of columns has to be four. That is quite obvious. So in that case, if we give it like this, still it compiles. We don't have to specify number of rows and number of columns all the time. Just giving one of them is enough. 
because 5 times 4 gives you 20. Okay, even if you give n call here, giving number of columns. So let me uh, compile is at W2, doesn't matter. Still, it gives you the matrix. Just assume. Uh, Um, you can give it anywhere, even here you can give it. I just want to show you that. Because as long as we are specifying the name of the argument, it doesn't matter. It doesn't give out an error. See, it's happening. So let's assume you give something like this. I want 15 rows and four columns. 15 but we don't have 60 elements here. 15 times 4 is 60. We have to have 60 elements to make this happen, right? So let's see how this is giving us. Same thing is repeated 1 to 20 column wise, row wise. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because five row is equal to equal true. You want 15 rows of these repeated. You are getting something like that. We don't have 60 elements here. This is all what we have in hand. We have data from one to 20. So we are getting this. Let's say we give this okay four times three is 12 but we have 20 elements right let's see what will happen a warning what is the warning in matrix this data length is 20 is not sub multiple or multiple of number of rows three it says it can fill up to 12 only. It comes with a warning, right? Because we told them to include 1 to 20, everything from 1 to 20, and we specified number of columns that we need is 4, number of rows that we need is 3. They can only incorporate the first 12 values in this pattern. They can't have from 13 to 20. They don't, they don't have any room because we do not enable them to have more than three rows. That is why they're giving us a warning message. Whenever we get an error message or a warning message, read through it. If there's any problem in your code, you will be able to identify, right? So that is that. Take this matrix W. Okay, let's take this one. So I'll simply put this here okay so we have saved w in our environment now we are going to add names of these so can you see these are the names that they have given by default always the index go with row comma column row comma column so this is the first row comma the blank means the entire column Okay, uh, second row blank means entire these entire columns. Second row, all the columns. Blank comma one means every row comma in the first column, every row in the first column. So if you want to extract data, let's say you want to have this entire uh, row uh, column extracted, you simply have to type this. Uh, that is index. 
See, you are getting six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. If you want to get the fourth row of W, fourth row, row index is four, column index is nothing. Four, nine, fourteen, nine. See, four, nine, fourteen, nine. I'll just put comments, extract, second column. Okay. If you want to extract an element in a particular column and a particular row, how should you do? W, let's say you want to extract 13, which is in the third row. Third, okay, I'll extract this one to avoid confusions. Third row, fourth column, three comma four. Always you have to give the row index first and the column index second. You are getting 18. If you want to extract 13, you have to give three comma three. Third row, third column, third row, third column. So that is how you extract elements from a matrix. Now we are going to give column names. Uh, so we'll take a variable, let's say call names. Okay, don't give that because it is a function in R. So let's give something else. It's a predefined function. It's an inbuilt function in R. So don't give those things as variable names. C and col column names. I'm going to give as so it's a name. It's a it's going to be a name. It's a string type. Okay. So within inverted commas, I'm going to give the column name. So I say I would say column one. You can give any name. Column two. Um, column three. How many columns do we have in W? Uh, one, two, three, four. Column four. Similarly, we are going to give row names as well. Row names. Okay, we don't have an inbuilt function for row name, Rn. And we are going to give row one. We have five rows. Comma separated. As these are strings, as these are texts, you have to give it within inverted commas. Otherwise, it would give you errors. Row three, row four, row five. Okay, we have five rows. Then you are going to assign. Um, Uh, okay, now we are going to uh, assign these row names and column names to the matrix W. Okay, so I'll comment here for your reference. Column names, these are the row names. And also it's a good practice in R when you are defining variables, um, although you have the comment or not, uh try to give a meaningful name so c n stands for column a don't give x and y you can give it compiles still it compiles but it's very hard to find out what you have done so it's a good practice to always go with um na representative names it's easy for you and me both so i'm going to um reconstruct w um of W, I'm going to assign uh, C N and row names also they have 
a function row names of w i'm going to assign the row names that we created here and then we print w you are getting all the column names and the row names so we created a vector of column names and we assigned it to our matrix column names of our matrix so call names is an inbuilt function here that we use call names will um, implant the names that you give to these and i assigned row names uh, so this is again a inbuilt function in r in the base package we assigned our row names for this and when we print w it is not the old w that we had so if we recompile this and get w this is the initial w that we are getting when we did made this change you are going to have your new w like this even though you compiled this you should be getting our new w if you want our old w matrix you have to recompile this line and this line did you understand uh someone please confirm yes ma'am got it okay thank you right um pulling out values that is also done yeah so pulling out values by giving this is done right uh, now if i want to pull out values by giving these row names and column names i can simply uh, i don't know whether this would work let's see okay still it's happening first row second column although we changed the names by this command they understand that we are referring to the first row and the second column first row and the second column six still we can give the same thing by the names that we uh, used w first row means row 1 second row is column 2 we should be getting the same thing 6 so that is pulling out values by given user defined row and column names okay Okay, now uh, this is two dimensional right vectors are one dimensional they um, this matrices are two dimensional now we are going to discuss another two dimensional form which is called data frames it's like a worksheet excel worksheets This is done just for your easy reference. Otherwise, there are so many comments here and there. Okay, data frame. Uh, N A means not available once I told you that before. So, data frame is again a two-dimensional matrix type, a matrix type data format, but still it enables different data types. In matrix, you know, we can have only um, uh, numbers. included in matrices numbers that's how we can do matrix operations and all that data frame is something like you can have a combination a collection of numbers 
uh, strings or letters, text, you can have anything, right? So that is what we call a data frame. So there, um, let's, uh, okay, let me uh, tell you how to uh, get a data frame. So first of all, we have to have some vectors in hand to in include in a data frame. So let me take the first vector as V1. Okay, there, uh, let's say I want to have values 10, 7, 13, 5. This is a vector, okay? And second vector, uh, let's take a string vector. So, bread. Within the vector, we cannot have different data types. You can't have bread, 10. You can't have things like that, okay? You give another name for that. It's not a vector. Butter, and, um, jam, and let's have an all value as well. Okay, this is B2. B3. Uh, let's have a logical vector. So let's say true, true. One, two, three, four. False. You can either type T R U E for true and F A L S E for false, or you can simply write capital letters for this. This is not a variable, this is true false. Simply you can write anything. And you are going to define your data frame, let's say DF. Okay. The command is data dot frame. What is the data frame? I want to include V1, V2, and V3 in my data frame. So this is how you construct a data frame using predefined vectors. Uh, V3 not found. See, it gives out an error. Error in data dot frame object V3 not found. Why? because I didn't compile it. See, V2, V1 is compiled, V2 is compiled. I have forgotten to compile V3. You have to compile V3 and then this. If you want to see the data frame, you just have to type in it. This is our V1 vector, V2 vector, V3, and this is data frame, okay? If you want to give uh, column names, uh, let's say, for V1, V2, and V3, if you want to change the names uh, to something, something meaningful, this is this is like an ID, right? This is an item, and this is, uh, let's say, quality, something, okay? So uh, if you want to um, replace V1, V2, V3, these vector names by some other names that we want to, we give the command names. We give the name of the data frame here because we are going to assign it to the date names of the data frame. So V1, V2, V3 are the names of this data frame that we constructed. What we want to is replace this by our names. I, I want to have some names. So let's say ID, always the name should be given within double quotes. Uh, I said item for this. And say this is uh, quality. It's meaningless, just, it's just given. Why are they giving? Unexpected come I need help. Mm 
I have to search and see uh, what's wrong with this. Um, so leave it aside. I'll tell that to you in the next lecture. This is not working. I'll find it out and tell you how to change the names. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Then uh, the next one is list. In the list, it is something like um, the vector. One dimensional but still it enables you to have any data type uh, within the list itself. So, for example, This is what we call a list. So list is a collection of everything, but still it is one dimensional. It's a list, list is a list. So the first element of this list is one. Second element of this list is, it's a string, it's a name, right? It's a text. Third element is true, it's a logical operator. This is a not available, this is a null, okay? F is false. See, you can either type F or you can type false here. It appears to be as false. This is again another name. See, this is a vector with two elements. It's not coming under five and six. It's not coming underneath, right? It's coming as a vector because let's say we have something like this here. 1 to 100, and this is too much. I'll put 1 to 10. It should come in line. See, we are getting all these just because this is a list and just because this is one dimensional. This is treated as one element. Although it is a vector inside, it's treated as a single element. That is what you call a list. Basically, the idea of time list. Um, okay, so this card is done. Wait, this one, I think I have missed this C here. I am not mistaken. Let's compile everything. Yes, I'm getting. Okay, what I wanted to was in the previous one, I, I suddenly got it recalled. In data frames, we initially had our vector names as column names. What I wanted to was replace these column names by uh, user-defined names, the names which I want to have. 
okay so what i did was names of df that will give you uh, that will lead you to access whatever the assignments that you have here names of these should be replaced by these three names so we have three names here v1 v2 v3 should be in order should be replaced by these earlier i had an error because i forgot this c we always have to give a list with this c so this is taken as a vector because these v1 v2 v3 are vectors they are vector names so vector names should be replaced by these so remember that when you are changing the names don't forget this like me this is the syntax now it is sorted okay so this is the list right okay so have to give you a small note on this um if somebody asks you what are the objects in r you can simply uh, give these out you can write this down or take a screenshot objects in r these are the stuff that you got as objects oops um character numeric character is uh, it, it's given under these okay. these are characters numeric are uh, real numbers even you can deal with uh, in integers which do not um, permit decimals in numeric you permit all the integers and decimals everything in integers you have the four numbers only either negative positive or zero and also you have complex numbers which we are not making use at this course finally you have logical operators that is true or false so these are the um, five objects or uh, you can say uh, five at atomic classes you can say atomic classes type of classes in r in r you can find these types basically similarly you can give a uh, specify factors in r um you should as in r um the command is this let's say uh f we assign it to f after user inbuilt function just like list c matrix data dot frame just like that you can give factor levels like this when you print f these are the levels 1 2 3 4 this is not a vector they take it as it seems to be like a vector 
meditating at factor levels. First factor, second, first level of the factor, second level of the factor. For example, let's say educational level, you have um, scholarship, O levels, A levels, degree, for example. So for scholarship, if it is one, it's the first level. O level, second level, A level, third level. Dip, uh, degree or diploma, fourth level, likewise. Factor levels mean within a variable. What is the variable there? Educational level. What are the levels of education? There you find scholarship, four levels, eight levels, and degree. So these are the factor levels. Factor is the variable. Levels are the categories that you find in. So this is how you give a factor in R. Okay, now um, let's talk about logical operators. All right, so let's say uh, G, another letter, is from 100. And say, um, if you print G, what will you get? One to 100, okay? Then type this inequality, G less than 50. What you will you get? Let's type and see. You're getting, so this is a logical operator. Inequality is a logical operator. So for all the values, which is less than 100, that is from one, to 49, 1 to 49, they give you as true. This is the 49, 46, 47, 48, 49. All these give you uh, the count of the leftmost element. So this is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eight, ninth, and this is the tenth. Likewise, this is the 18th, this is the 19th. So 49 up to 49th, where this is true, this is a statement, this statement is true, you are getting true. And for the rest, 50 and up to 100, you are getting false. When you run this command, you are getting whether the statement is true or false for each and every element of G. That is what you get. Uh, let's say out of G, out of the first 100 elements, you want to extract the first 50. How do you do that? Always when extracting, you have to write the thing where, where you're going to extract, put a square bracket, and then give the condition. What is the condition? We want from G, we want all the values that are true, that satisfy this statement, okay? It should give you values from 1 to 50, 1 to 49. So this is a logical operator, this one, and this is a logical statement, okay? So from G, from 1 to 100, we extracted where the elements are less than 50. So extracting is done by the square brackets. Extracted uh, is fine. Simple things. Okay, assume you want to get uh, out of G, which are less than five or greater than 95 or both of them, okay, or operator, okay? You write it like we have to extract from G where G 
elements of G is less than five, you can either keep space or remove, that's fine. You have to uh, type the vertical line like this. And then you want values which is greater than 95. If it is less than five, print it. Or if it is greater than five, still print it. So you should be getting values from one to four and 96 to 100. Let's see. One, two, three, four, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. So this is another way of extracting. So you learned that. This is the O operator. If you want, uh, where both these are happening, you should not be getting anything and operator. You just put an and here. Which satisfy both these. Is there anything like that? Less than five and greater than 95? No, right? We are getting into the zero. Just like numeric zero in the earlier case, this is not happening, right? This is not happening. So if we want to um, write a meaningful statement using and let's say, we want to extract values from one to 100 where it is less than five and it should be less than 95 even. So you should be expecting one, two, three, four. Let's see whether we are getting, yes. Both these conditions satisfy. So that is the O operator and an operator. All these are logical operators. You can even put brackets for this. You can simply highlight with shift, press the opening bracket. It will give you the close bracket automatically. How do you do that? Highlight with shift, press the opening bracket. It will give you both. Same thing. Either you can have the bracket or not, doesn't matter. Then, we are going to do something uh, interesting here, something mind blowing. Uh, okay, this is the last part. Just uh, do you have lectures at three? Any of you? No, madam. No. Okay. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, so let's say D is uh, if we want to get the square root of something, this is the command square root. Let's say square root of two. Okay, and if you print D, you are getting some value. But you know square root two is not a finite number. It's going ahead. But with the precision of this computer, you are getting this. It's a round of value. Okay. And let's say you took D times D. It should give you two because this is square root two. Okay. But if you type d times d equals to 2, you should be expecting, when you are giving equals, you have to give double equal, right? You should be expecting, okay, this statement is true. You should be expecting a true one, but you are not getting that. You are getting false. Why? We are seeing this too just because of the precision of this computer. If we really want to compare, although we expect a true for this, we are not getting it. Why? Because truly that's not happening because D is square root of two, which is an infinitely large number. This deals with the precision of the computer. They're dealing with the number of decimals that they incorporate. So if that is the case, right? Or, or you can, Simply uh, do it like this, d, d times d minus two. You should be expecting a zero, but you are not getting a zero. There's a very small gap between those two. 
This is the gap. Okay. So if you want to get zero, you have to use this command all dot equal. d times d, which means you handle the precision here. You're getting true. Or you can, uh, I don't know whether this happening. Um, this won't work. You have to get either true or false. So if you want to obtain, you know, square root of two multiplied by square root of two should give you two. Just because of the computer's precision, it's not giving you. So always when you're writing loops, when you're writing functions, if you want to have a true statement, use this method. Don't use this method because it depends on the precision. Computer's ability to handle more decimals. Okay, so that is that. Uh, we can uh, start off with, uh, did we miss anything? I'm just checking. Okay, do you have any questions regarding today's lesson? Anything uh, which is hard to understand or which is unclear? We can ask now. I'm going to share the script with you. I'll upload it to LMS with the video. Um, so it's easy for you. But don't depend on this script. Don't look at this script even. Just have it as a backup. Uh, don't even look at this. Just uh, You might have noted down things. Just try out uh, statements by your own. Use the reference books. And uh, I have to, uh, I'm giving you the assignment today and I'm giving you 20 days for that. Uh, but still uh, try to do it um, as much as possible. Um, let me log in once again. So when you log into your LMS, you will find your assignment here. So you can simply click on this. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to download this. The PDF file is uploaded there. It's a very simple assignment. Just read through it. You have to make a video. You can use either Zoom or any other platform. Doesn't matter. But I, I think you have to do a screen sharing with your video on. Okay, that's what you have to do. Uh, because I have to make sure that it's you who are doing this. Uh, just like I taught you today, you have to screen share. And the task is there. Okay, uh, you have to read through and do the task. Uh, so I have given you a tip also. Just try the task without recording. Try the task and you know what to do. Then start recording. Okay. So you have 20 days for that. Deadline is... Uh, okay, let me show that to you. This is the assignment. So deadline is 2nd of November, 11.59 p.m. Because this portal gets closed after this deadline. So this is the task you have to do. Uh, so I don't want lengthy videos. If, if it is ending in two seconds, it doesn't matter. Just have it like that. I don't want lengthy videos, uh, but make it maximum to 10 minutes. It can be three minutes, it can be two minutes, it can be even seconds, it doesn't matter. And there's a limitation in LMS when you are uploading a video, it enables you only up to 100 megabytes. So. I don't think 10 minutes video would go beyond that. Even if it did, there are so many online softwares that you can reduce your video size without changing your quality. Or you can simply use Handbrake. There's a software called Handbrake. With application, you can download that. Or you can use any freely available online software because this is very small video. So you have to do this. Um, and you will be getting 40 marks. Uh, this is not out of 100. So I'm going to uh, concatenate all the assignment and give you 40%, okay? So for this, 40 marks. For the next assignment also would be 40 marks. I'm going to average it out. Uh, 
that's how i'm going to evaluate so you have a lot of time to do it this is a very very simple thing um so that is all about the assignment uh please do that and here uh, just check how to install r and r studio uh, from this video everything is clearly explained step by step just like i did uh, it's better than that because it installs and show you and i'll put the recording here and the r script file as well if any one of you wants to go through um so yeah that's it so next week uh, we are having the lesson although it's a poor day um so please get ready for that uh if there's any miss just go through the recordings but as much as possible try to attend lectures this is very important you can ask questions you can interact with me so that is what i'll upload the recording today and uh, yeah next day we'll discuss uh, pattern data how to make generate pattern data arbitrary data random data all sorts of data types next step so let me stop the recording stop share